Bonds is a, an online platform. We specialize at providing accurate market data inf information about financial markets, such as bonds and shares. And our today's seminar is our first seminar about China bond market in English. It is dedicated to completing C-Bonds China Interbank bond market coverage. Today, we will talk about market statistics, about ratings, risks, and about how an international investor can enter the China onshore bond market. Our today's speakers are from Bond Connect, Hanyuan International, and Agricultural Bank of China. So today's format is first the speaker's presentation and then Q&A session. So you can write your questions right in the chat and the speakers will answer them after their presentation. And uh, today I will introduce you some descriptive statistics about the China domestic bond market and familiarize you with our C-Bonds website. Let us start with the market volume. The China market volume is the second largest uh, market in the world right after the USA and the volume of the market keeps growing. So, as you can see here, China, we, we estimate China's uh, bond market volume at about 13 trillion US dollars, while, for example, India, the second largest emerging markets bond market, at about 2 trillion dollars. As I said, the volume of the market keeps growing, so in one and a half year, it has significantly grown by like 50% in the corporate bond sector from 4 trillion to more than 6 trillion US dollars. Uh, let's go now to the structure of the bond market. The structure of the bond market is, as shown in the slide, represented by 20% of government bonds, <clears throat> then 30% of local government bonds, and over 50% is represented by corporate bonds. But note that 21% out of all issuance volume is represented by policy banks, which are quasi-government institutions. Well, they're responsible for some uh, politics realization. Then that is 14% for uh, banks and financial institutions, then 7% for uh, construction and development and the other sectors. Now let us talk about sovereign China. Uh, about China issuers, so the issuance of Chinese uh, of Chinese government is mainly in Chinese yuan or renminbi. It's more than ninety eight percent of its total issuance. As for the credit quality of the issuer, well, it is on A one A plus. A plus level according to the big three, depending to the rating agency, and we can see that it didn't really change over the last few years. As for the default probability, we can see here that among the selected emerging markets, China has the lowest default probability. It is less than 10% in 10 year time, which is, well, which is quite good. Now, talking about the key issuers of the market, we should mention the policy banks. As I said, those are quasi-government institutions and they include the China Development Bank, Agriculture Development Bank of China and China Exim Bank. So, the largest by the issuance volume is the China Development Bank. As you can see here, over 98% of the issuers' issuances is done in renminbi, 
and the issuances are quite liquid as you can see here it's well traded the yields of the issuer are on the short term at about 2.5 3.5 percent level annum which is quite close to the government yields and now let us talk about the government yields let's go to the g curve uh, the G curve, the short end, is traded at about 2.43% annum, and the long tail is traded at about 3.4% level. Uh, as for the yield dynamics, uh, let's look here. The yield dynamics on the slide are represented by the blue lines, and we can see that over last two years, uh, the lines were just fluctuating at about 2.5 up to 3% level depending on the term to maturity of the yield and there is definitely a natural decrease in yields in April July of 2020. As for corporate bonds we can see that the yields of triple A bonds over past four years has dropped a bit, while single A, triple B, double B, and single B uh, yield has risen a bit. Now the triple A and double A yields, they are quite close. That's worth mentioning. As for the two years dynamics of only triple A corporate bonds, we can see they are quite close to the dynamics of the government bonds. They fluctuated about 3% level, and there is a sharp drop in spring of 2020. Now, talking about the spring of 2020, it is worth mentioning that coronavirus bonds are also called the coronavirus prevention and control bonds. Such bonds were issued with easier, with simplified issue procedure. Instead, the issuers of such bonds had to contribute at least 10% of their issuance volume to prevention and control of COVID-inducted epidemiological situation. Uh, for example, manufacturing of medical products or certain infrastructure constructions, etc. And the bonds were mainly short term. We can see that term to maturity, the major part is in one year and less than one year sector. As for large significant share of banks and financial institutions here, by issuers, it can be easily explained by the political bank's contribution to the coronavirus situation. And now, talking about the coronavirus, it's worth mentioning our C bonds indexes, which includes, for example, coronavirus confirmed cases in China, which is very useful nowadays, or, for example, CDS, according to those, the uh, default probability was calculated or the GDP and large number of other indexes. And in the end of my presentation, I would also like to say a few words about our China bond market database. Uh, it includes over 24,000 bonds with the bond search parameters and over 10,000 issuers and over 10,000 quotes of those bonds are updated on a daily basis. That is all for my presentation for today. Thank you very much. Here are my contacts. You can write me here or in the chat. I will be very happy to answer your questions. And I see a question here. Is the yield rate in US dollars? As you can see here, I use the euro bonds uh, yields, but the yields in here are in domestic currency in uh, renminbi. So I hope I answered your question. So I will 
not hold you back any longer and I will introduce you our next speaker who is Senior Vice President and Head of Sales and Marketing Department from Bond Connect, Phoebe Liam. Phoebe, hi. Hello. Okay, so um, everyone has heard of a very interesting overview of the China on onshore bond market from Alexander. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank you, Seabonds, for inviting Bond Connect as a speaker for the very first time. We're actually joining hands today to talk about China and its increasing importance in the eyes of international investors. So in my session today, I will shed more light on how international investors like yourselves can assess the China bond market. Um, it is for sure an increasingly attractive market that offers decent diversification and new opportunities amid the global low rates environment, especially in the past year. So Bond Connect Company is a joint venture between Hong Kong Exchange and CFX, which is in turn owned by the Chinese Central Bank, which we call the PBOC. Bond Connect is a major development by the PBOC as we have launched to facilitate foreign entrance and push for market developments. So till now, in just three years of launch, we have seen a significant leap, whether it's in terms of accounts opened, trading volume and tickets, foreign holdings, or the global coverage we spent across, which you can see this slide from here. Now, this strong phenomenon can actually be explained by, by four key factors of why China. I always talk about it. Number one is definitely the growth potential. If we look at the size of the market, which um, I am going to show you from um, the slide on um, over here. Alexander has also briefly looked into the size of the market as well. China has already exceeded Japan to be the second largest bond market in the world with an annual compound growth of 18%. Number two, are definitely attributed to the yield enhancements. And number three, I think is something as simple as diversification, which I think most of you will agree. And the last but not least, global asset allocation needs, such as SDR and index inclusion, which is a trend that you are seeing definitely increasingly. Eventually, access to China market and various investment instruments will only progressively ease as we are clearly targeting to boost international participation rate from less than 2% before we were launched to 15% down the road. We are actually now at 3.4%. Now, when we are looking at the China interbank bond market, um, you always hear some people saying, you know, why is it called interbank bond market? You know, why do we need to, um, you know, classify as interbank specifically? The reason is that in the onshore market, there are two different bond markets, one being called the interbank bond market, the other one being the exchange bond market. Now, allow me um, one minute just to explain to you the difference in the market, which I think is actually quite important to you. So first of all, the interbank bond market, which we call the CIBM, has 87% of the total bond market liquidity, where the exchange market only has 13% of the market liquidity. Now, when you are talking about, for example, the CIBM agent model or, for example, the Bond Connect scheme itself, we actually provide access for the international investors directly into the CIBM, which is the interbank bond market. Why it's called the interbank bond market is because it is a market where all the financial institutional investors are located in. Whereas in the exchange market, it is more dominated by retail investors or securities. So essentially, if you are entering the market into the interbank bond market, say, for example, via the Bond Connect market, uh, via the Bond Connect scheme, excuse me, then automatically you'll be faced with all the financial institutional investors or market makers. You'll be prone to, uh, to be able to see larger ticket size rather than um, ticket size in all lots. And also the spreads will automatically be tighter. That's the reason why it's been so um, attractive to many of the international investors. Now, in the CIBM, as you can see from the next slide here, you can actually be exposed to different bond types in the market. 
for example, the CGB, China government bonds, which Alexander also covered about, it has extremely good market liquidity with spreads of say around 0.5 to one basis point. We also have policy banks, um, which is also equally as good in the liquidity. And there are some other more aggressive investors that like to look into some credit bonds as well. For example, some CDBs, um, sorry, some, uh, some NCDs that are issued by the joint stock commercial banks in China, some CPs or MTNs or corporate bonds that are issued by the credit issuers in onshore. So the increase in the trading momentum for China, um, sorry, allow me to change back. The increase in the trading momentum for China among international investors definitely has strong attribution to the value proposition that the China bond market presents. So if you look at the chart here, it stimulates the yield curves of the most frequently traded bonds and um, raised bonds as well included. For example, the 10 year CGB here, you can actually see that it can yield easily about 3.18%. And on the next slide on this page, just one sec, you'll be able to see a stark comparison of the China government bonds versus the G7 regions, which are either in low yields or in negative yield territories. So the next question where many people will frequently ask is that how does Bond Connect work? Now, having traded across all the different SS channels myself in the last 10 years, how Bond Connect successfully persuaded me as an SS scheme is actually how its architecture and design is based on how friendly it is to international investors when it comes to onboarding, trading, and settlement frameworks, which actually are all equally very important in international investors' eyes, making it the popular go-to scheme for many of the global investors. So despite Bond Connect is headquartered in Hong Kong, its design is based on the integration of an international infrastructure base, allowing to operate under international laws and practices, which is very important. So if we look at the flow chart here, first of all, the design of trading in Bond Connect utilizes e-trading platforms such as TradeWeb and Bloomberg, which interfaces directly with the onshore trade booking system called CFAX. Investors are able to send RFQs to 56 onshore Bond Connect dealers and conduct its block trade allocation autonomously without needing to appoint an onshore agent for trade input, achieving full control of trade execution, speed, and accuracy, which is not achieved by the other SS schemes. And secondly, under Bond Connect, investors are not required to open any accounts in onshore for their bond holdings. Instead, they hold their CIBM bonds, meaning the interbank bonds, through the global custodians, which they already existingly use, and the local CMU custodian banks via the Hong Kong Central Bank CMU nominee accounts. Effectively, this also means that all cash accounts and operational flows can be maintained offshore without the need of an onshore bond settlement agent like the other SS schemes that operates under onshore PRC laws. Now, all in all, this is um, the advantage of the Bond Connect model. And I would actually say that a comparison of Bond Connect across the traditional SS schemes has led to a very wide perception that Bond Connect is a more direct, easier, and faster route. Now, on average, our application process takes about three to four weeks, as you can see from our slide here, with the quickest approval seem to be around three days, especially with the launch of our e-filing system last year. Now, coming to the more exciting part of my presentation, which is the momentum of Bond Connect. Now, for those that have been following our Bond Connect footsteps closely, you'll realize a lot of breakthroughs are being made recently. The rising impact of Bond Connect as a major China investment channel is most evidently seen in the speed of client adoption in the last three years. And we have crossed over 2,500 investors before the Chinese New Year. The approved Bond Connect investors have seen a 165% year-on-year increase, and we have now far exceeded the total number across all the traditional schemes such as the QFEE, RQFEE, and the CIBM agent model since April last year. And from an entity's perspective, we have now 645 financial institutions being signed up, bringing in their funds and mandates 
into the China market. Now on the next slide. For Bond Connect, we welcome investors of all financial institution types except for retail. And interestingly, over 88% of the accounts opened belong to products or mandates of asset managers. As of now, we have attracted 78 out of the top 100 global AMs list. And decent momentum has actually been observed as well from our top 100 global banks and beyond. And in the past year, we have seen an emerging interest coming in from pension funds and sovereign accounts like central banks and sovereign wealth funds that have been joining Bond Connect either directly or as mandates to external asset managers. And this does not come as a surprise because you know, the reserve function of RMB is increasingly being reflected globally. And not to mention, we are also starting to receive a lot of inquiries from private banks and the asset owners themselves. Now, in 2020, we welcomed the investors from Russia, Finland, South Africa, and also a first trade from South America, totaling our coverage across 34 jurisdictions globally. Now, at the moment, U.S. accounts represent the largest investor base with 36% of the accounts opened, followed by Hong Kong. So, you know, um, Bond Connect may be a Hong Kong um, uh, um, setup, but then we're no longer just a Hong Kong story. The third largest investor base will be UK, Singapore, and then Japan. Increasing interests are also seen from other areas like the Nordic Europe, South Africa, Middle East and Latin America recently. And I guess the next page will actually be a page where many of our investors or the audience will be interested. The speed of our development is definitely also manifested in the rising momentum in trading activities. So amid all the macro risks that we are seeing, especially in 2020 um, last year, the China bond market undoubtedly remained as the window of opportunities when it comes to yield. In January, we posted a record trading volume of 41.6 billion RMB in one single day, pulling up our ADT to 29.4 billion in January alone from a 20 billion RMB yearly average in 2020. That is around a 50% increase. I believe the trading momentum will start to gather even more steam because we are observing a lot of investors which has been sitting on the sideline have emerged for trading. Now, despite Hong Kong continues with the lead of about 67% of the flows, the second largest player is UK with 12% of the activities, followed by Singapore, US and Japan. And while a lot of volume trading is driven by banks, which is around 65 to 70% of the flows, if we take a shift and look at the trading tickets, we can immediately analyze for the fact that a lot of activities recently are related to the influx of asset management flows with them representing 60% of the tickets printed. So a stronger expectation of FTSE index inclusion of Chinese securities this year, after Bloomberg and JP Morgan in the last two years, I believe more inflows are definitely expected this year from index trackers and also hungry investors that are in, um, in search for yields. So, um, with this slide, you will also be able to see that, you know, what are the Bond Connect investors trading? We can easily see that, you know, um, there are a lot of investors that start their Chinese investments from the more response, for example, in CGBs and policy banks, which I mentioned. And eventually, there will be more investors that will be looking into more credit names or financial institution names like NCBs. And the most popular tenors nowadays, people are looking at the seven to 10 year tenor below one year or the three to five year being the valley. The most active tenors in the onshore trading, whether in rates or credit, will be one to 10 years. So on this slide, I'm going to be talking about, you know, what are Bond Connect's key driving forces that deepen international participation in the China market? So first of all, um, as we have already talked about, it will be the strong client adoption that has already been seen since its launch, which apart from really giving credit to the ongoing enhancements to the market, a lot of attention has been drawn due to the progressive index inclusions, which we talk about by the mainstream indices. In the last two years, we have progressively enabled real DVP. Uh, we have enhanced block trading functions. 
we cleared the roads for various client types to apply entry for one uh, the China market, including the Irish users funds, and enable Japanese funds to launch applications referencing its trusty account structure as well. Last year, to name a few, we enabled trading our extension to 8 p.m. Beijing time to enable more European investors to come into trade. Settlement amendments and extension of settlement cycles beyond T plus three. We also had the addition of Bond Connect market makers to a total of 56 dealers, as I've mentioned. We have a 25% reduction to Bond Connect service fee. And to close the third quarter, we have introduced the third party FX to enable best FX execution for investors. And it does not end here. In October last year, we have also announced the launch of the E-Prime system, which will eventually allow for direct offshore participation in onshore primary auctions. In sum, Bond Connect is now playing on a much bigger landscape. Now, briefly in the last session here, last but not least, I just want to give everyone a quick overview of um, how the bond, bond, uh, bond Connect application process works. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it is definitely possible to get your own, yourself onboarded in three to four weeks time. The tips for me is that you can actually execute a few things concurrently. First of all, you should approach your custodian or local trustee to facilitate obtaining your CMU account number one for each filing. Secondly, contract with one of our e-trading platforms now being TradeWeb or Bloomberg. Thirdly, and remember to do this right from the start, submit your filing forms to us at Bond Connect Company as your dedicated account manager leads you through our guidance and reviews before submitting to PBOC. And upon PBOC approval, a CFAX ID will be generated for you and you can commence trading. Now, don't forget, we have also rolled out our e-filing globally last year, which has replaced all the manual form submission. The portal allows investors or custodians to communicate with their onboarding managers in a more timely and convenient manner. And investors are able to gauge at any time what stage the application process is at. We have actually seen a time saving of about 67% in investor filings. So please do approach us to get yourself started or to actually navigate in our website to get a first glimpse of our system. So at this juncture, I wrap up my presentation. So all in all, I would actually say that we are sitting on an exponential curve of growth, whether it is for China assets as a whole or even just for Bond Connect. So please do join us and capture the opportunities and be part of this historical growth story. Um, over to you, Alexander. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Phoebe. That was very interesting presentation. And here mm -hmm. we've got uh, questions about entering the onshore bond market and about uh, Bond Connect uh, versus QFII and CIBM Direct. Can yes. you comment on that? Uh, yes, sure, of course. Um, for that, will I be able to draw back a reference to one of my slides? Yeah, please, sure. Yeah. So uh, with this, I would actually reference this slide here. I know that it is actually crowded with a lot of information, but again, if you want to reference this slide again after the presentation, please feel free to approach um, CBONS to do so. So um, with CIBM Direct, actually this um, agent model has been around in the market for quite a couple of years already. It initially started in 2011 and ongoing, it has been seeing a lot of different um, uh, enhancements on the way. And um, I would actually actually say that, you know, um, CIBM agent model has definitely been the mainstream um, asset scheme for many of the asset managers before 2017 or even before 2018, before the launch of uh, Bond Connect. Um, however, there are many investors' comments or mainly um, asset managers, um, uh, as, as uh, Chris has mentioned here, um, many, many uh, comments from the asset managers saying that, you know, the CIBM agent model is actually 
actually a model that is very agent dependent. So it actually allow it actually requires um, uh, all the uh, offshore investors to engage with an onshore bond settlement agent, open all the cash accounts offshore, bond account onshore, and the application process is is, is also very timely because the investors would take quite a long time in signing new custodian agreement with an onshore um, settlement agent, which is all referencing to PRC laws. And there are also um, uh, um, uh, investors commenting that um, with the cash account being onshore, it is not only the bonds tax that they need to be um, um, aware of because on their cash accounts, they will also be receiving interest. And there are actually tax implications on the cash outstanding in the, in, in the onshore system as well. So with the Bond Connect, the reason why we have designed our scheme to ensure all the accounts, all the relevant accounts are sitting onshore, for, uh, offshore, for example, the cash account, um, this actually allows the fact that at any point in time, our offshore investors will not have any cash exposure in the offshore market, meaning there will be no tax implications on their cash as well. And for Bond Connect, because we allow for offshore investors to utilize their existing GC global custodian, local custodian offshore um, uh, in the international space, referencing the international laws. They don't need to actually engage in the new signing of a whole custodian package again. They can be using the existing um, uh, custodian for um, uh, to assess the onshore market. That's the reason why the whole preparation stage is actually comparatively much shorter compared to the CIBM agent model. One being two to four weeks for Bond Connect, and for the CIBM agent model two to six months. Now, for um, when we talk about the cost, uh, one thing that I definitely would like to highlight is the fact that um, for a bond connect and CIBM agent model, because you need to assess the cost in multiple areas, for example, the custodian cost, the custodian cost for CIBM agent model will be entirely on the onshore bond settlement agent, um, whether they charge you by um, uh, by trading volume, because I know some of the um, uh, onshore agents do do that. So, for example, you know, if you are trading at 100 million, then they may also have, um, you know, a per basis point charge based on the trading volume. Um, they may have different custodian charges as well. And for the Bond Connect side, um, yes, definitely, there will be um, local custodian charges in the offshore market, for example, the GC charges, the local custodian charges, um, which can differ across different custodians. However, for Bond Connect side, uh, for sure, we actually do not charge investors in the trading. We only charge the SS platforms, which at the moment, uh, which from, from what I know, TradeWeb and Bloomberg, they are now um, not absorbing the cost, but feeding the fees through to the investors. But what I know from the investors, whether it's on the custodian front or whether it's the Bond Connect front, I think they will be able to engage in bilateral discussions with the custodians or the e-trading platforms in negotiating for a better price. And I think this is for both Bond Connect and CIBM agent model. So in general, um, I will not um, say that you know whether CIBM agent model or Bond Connect is cheaper than the other or which is uh, more expensive, because I have definitely heard from some AMs or banks that um, for Bond Connect, it is actually um, cheaper for them. It's actually more economical for them. Uh, how should an institutional investor compare the CIBM and the Bond Connect? So you have answered that. Thank you very much, Phoebe. Sure thing. And uh, th thank you very much, Alexander. And thank you very much, Chris. Um, I think I believe um, uh, my slide that I referred to just then will also um, answer Antonio's um, question between um, uh, the Bond Connect and the QV as well. So um, I just want to make a very quick comment on, the, on that, if you don't mind, Alexander. So um, uh, Antonio, on QV, it is more of a, um, a traditional um, uh, asset scheme that many of the investors have looked into before, I would say, 2013 or 2014. Uh, traditionally, the QV, our QV, they were constrained by quota, but um, you know, good news last year, 
is that um, all the quotas have um, actually already been um, lifted. Um, however, a frequent um, assessment among um, foreign institutional investors is the fact that whether they need access to the exchange bond market at all. Because for QFI, um, I think the extra benefit is that they can also allow you to have access to the exchange bond market. If you remember from the beginning of my presentation, I mentioned that the exchange bond market is more dominated by retail investors, by securities. But in the exchange market, despite it is only around 10% of the market liquidity, it may also present you with some of the um, uh, corporate bonds or some credit bonds, which are not um, uh, frequently issued in the um, interbank bond market. For example, um, some real estate names, as, as example. So it really depends on whether you need exposure into those. However, if you are mainly looking into race bonds like, you know, um, CGBs, policy banks, or, you know, the bank notes or some of the credit corporate bonds that we talked about, which many of the foreign in institutional investors find, you know, find sufficient, then I think you can safely um, just be using a channel which allows you access into the interbank bond market because that already represents close to 90% of the total market um, liquidity. And also not to mention the second very big consideration is the fact that for QFI, because you have also um, access to the exchange market, the exchange market is actually regulated by a different regulator, which is the CSRC. Now, if you have the access to the exchange market, you your application process will have ex, um, uh, approval from CSRC. Also, because you have the interbank exposure, you will need um, uh, uh, extra approval from PBOC. And not to mention because on the Q fee, um, it is also regulated by SAFE, to control um, you know, uh, the, the, the cross-border uh, flows, you will have three regulators to get your approvals from. That's the reason why QFI, very frequently people will say that it will take much longer um, than the other newer schemes. And I have seen people waiting for more than half a year, even for over one year for QFI. So that is the biggest comparison. So I hope I answered your question, Antonio. And thank you very much, Alexander, for moderating. Thank you, thank you, Phoebe, for coming. Welcome, we welcome you next thank time. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you very much. And um, any questions, please feel free to relay to myself or my team. Thank you very much. I hope you present, um, enjoy the presentation. Our next speaker, it's Mr. Terry Zhang from Penguin International. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, ha uh, hello, everyone. My name is Terry Zhang. I'm with a credit rating agency called Penguin International. Uh, my topic today is ratings and the risk on Chinese onshore bond market. Uh, before we start, I would like to just take a few minutes to uh, introduce who we are and what we do. Um, Pengyuan International is the international arm of CSEI Pengyuan, which is a 20, 28 years old Chinese domestic rating agency. We're based in Hong Kong and providing a credit rating of global scale. As you know, the global scale rating is coming naturally to the global investors, but actually when accessing to the Chinese onshore credits, you normally don't see that. Uh, but as uh, Phoebe correctly pointed out, China is opening up very, very quickly, and the global investment interest on Chinese credits, uh, onshore credits, are on, uh, on the rise. So our global ratings on Chinese credits can provide a familiar tool and handy tool for the global investors to easily understand and compare the credit worthiness of those Chinese onshore credits. Uh, so I will explain the credit rating part in more detail later on in my presentation. Um, so our group shareholder is called China Securities Credit Investment, or CSCI for short. Uh, it's commissioned by the CSRC, which is a, which is which is the security regulator uh, of China, and backed by 35 Chinese financial companies. Uh, you actually can see a, a few familiar names here on the list: and the PICC, the insurance company, and the Guotai Junan and the Haitong uh, security firm, which is pretty active outside of China as well. Okay, so let me get into my presentation. Uh, so our speaker today will each cover one, you know, some aspect of Chinese onshore bond market, and uh, together we, we try to present you a full, a full picture. So as a rating agency, our focus is always on the credit risk. So particularly the default events, as we see, is picking up pretty quickly in China in recent years. Okay, in the first chart here, we have a default statistic uh, going from 2014 to 2020. 
So overall, it's an up, upward trend. Uh, so all the defaults happen in the so-called quality, quality bond space and the interest rate bond space, which is the most of uh, the foreign allocation uh, are aiming at, remain default free. The blue line here is a number of, of the bond defaults uh, in uh, over these years. So in 2020, uh, we actually saw a drop in a number of defaulted bonds. And this is most likely thanks to the accommodative monetary environment uh, in 2020, which is a pandemic struck year. Uh, but the average size of the default bond become bigger. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so is the total defaulted, uh, defaulted amount. Uh, okay, so sorry, so back to this page. So what is not shown here is that China actually had zero defaults prior to 2014. But this is not to say that those credits were impeccable in the past. Uh, but it shows that how the market was once completely dominated by the credit backing from the government and the banks. So despite uh, the appearances of the safety to come, so zero defaults could actually be problematic in many ways in the long run. Uh, for example, the, 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 the price discovery could be distorted and thus the, the uh, result in the insufficient uh, resources, resources allocation. And it could also give rise to uh, severe moral hazards uh, to some extent. Uh, so in my own view, other than the quite de deterioration of, uh, of those uh, defaulted cases, the increase of defaults is actually also a signal of the Chinese authorities' higher tolerance towards default and the philosophy that uh, they have to let the market breathe more naturally than before. So while maintaining the whole stability and order, because uh, currently the default rate is still, uh, is about 1.5% overall, which is still on, uh, on the low end globally. Yeah. Another aspect to concern about is that we see more higher names that went into default in recent years. So when I say higher up, I typically uh, it typically means stay on in nature, and uh, typically with high rating. Uh, in 2020, there there are 47 first time defaulters in China, uh, of which 29 are POE, which stands for private uh, privately owned enterprises. Uh, 18 are SOE, the state owned enterprises. Uh, it raised a lot of concern. Uh, SOE defaulters went up by the 23 percent compared to to 2019. Because uh, this, this is a space once enjoy, I would say, the full spectrum of, uh, advantage in China um, as a socialist country. Um, I mean, business, the access, regulation, policy, capital and finance, you name it. Uh, so in the past, a lot of investors uh, could be numb about the SOE credit risk with the assumption that the government support is always there, is, is, is iron casted. Uh, so are a lot of rating agencies in China as well. Uh, but now these assumptions are, putting, uh, are put under question. The market has to return to the base case analysis, uh, you know, to drill into the cash flow coverage ratio, the profitability and the business profiles, stuff like that. Uh, but, uh, but do not get me wrong, the government backing is still there in China and affects the, affects the credit in a big way. Um, the lesson is just that we cannot simply take those support for granted. And we have to look into the degree of support on a case-by-case -case basis uh, more, uh, way more carefully than before. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have a Chinese national rating distribution when those names got into default. Um, you can see I, I use a red circle there. That's, that's the AA plus and the AAA uh, national skill rating space. This is the area we used to consider as safe in China, uh, but we see a lot more defaults happens in these two uh, rating notches in 2019 and 2020. Uh, there are more shared traits of these highly rated defaulters. For example, uh, the, the, the default uh, typically happens on the uh, holding company level. It means that the, the operating subsidiary are more are doing more uh, are doing more or less okay, but the holding parents went into problem. Uh, the over diversification, over diversification. So when businesses are trying to get into the business area that they, uh, you know, they they just simply are not good at, uh, or do not have ex uh, expertise in. Uh, so that will result in a cash outlay with poor return. So not to mention that wasted wasted time and effort, uh, highly leveraged, highly restricted, 
uh, cash position. So this means that it has sufficient cash and the cash equivalents standing, standing on the balance sheet, but a lot of them are restricted because uh, uh, so, you know, for, for many reasons. So this kind of money cannot be used to repay the debt. So ma maturity mismatch is also uh, very common. Uh, companies uh, uh, will resort to raise short-term uh, finances and roll over to fund the, lo the long-term projects. Uh, so this situation could easily lead to the liquidity issue in China. So one of the most prominent default cases in 2020 is called Yongcheng Coal and Elect uh, Electricity Holdings, or YCEH for short. Uh, it is really AAA in Chinese national scale reading, uh, and one of the most important government-owned entity of Henan province, which has a moderate government financial in China. Uh, the default happened in November 2020. It's a first default. Uh, if if it first default on only on one billion uh, Chinese yuan, uh, 270 days short-term commercial paper, and then quickly spread into other instruments like MTNs and commercial papers across the board. Uh, the default caused a major turmoil in the onshore market. Uh, uh, I mean, many primary market uh, bond issuances got canceled, uh, coupled with a ma massive credit bond sell-off in the Chinese market. Um, and later on, the Financial Stability and Development Committee, which is one of the highest financial authority in China, got involved to calm the market. Um, you know, extra, extraordinary uh, monetary actions uh, kicked in with several top provincial level officials voiced out to try to reassure the market. Um, uh, its impact even got transmitted or spilled over into the rate bond space. As we see, uh, there, there were about five bits uptick in the 10 year Chinese treasury by that time. There are two reasons why uh, the impact of YCEH default is so profound. Firstly, I would say the default was largely unexpected, um, you know, out of the conventional quite wisdom in China. Not only it is, it is an important uh, AAA rated SOE, but also uh, its, its external financing actually is looking okay. Uh, the official cash figure, you know, looks way more than sufficient on the, um, uh, on the balance sheet for, for the repayment. And the rating was, ju was also just got uh, reaffirmed not long ago. So later, later on, we will no know that most of those cash figures were restricted, so cannot be used for the, the bond repayment. Uh, secondly, it was uh, another higher up SOE name went into default in recent months before uh, uh, YCEH, we already have a bri uh, brilliant auto defaulted. Uh, they were known as uh, for its joint venture uh, and, uh, and the local production for BMW automobiles. Uh, so as of now, YCEH has sold part of the equity to repay about 50% of the defaulted bonds. And the, remain, uh, the remaining defaulted amount was extended for uh, 270 days. So afterwards, you know, uh, nine company, including banks, security firms, rating agencies, and, and, and auditors got penalized out of the regulators uh, uh, investigation. Some are reprimanded, some are fined, and some are, you know, suspended for, for, for business. Um, sorry, looking forward to 2021 and beyond, we do expect that the default will, will keep go up in China especially in the sector with overcapacity, high cyclicality, and heavy pollution. Uh, and also real estate sector is, uh, uh, I would say, it would, would worth investors' attention as well. We know that uh, there are now five red lines imposing on the property issuers and also their banks, and uh, it will for sure cause pressure. And earlier we, we talked about how the number of uh, the bond default actually dropped in 2020, but this is probably caused by the, uh, the, the easy monetary environment in 2020 in order, in order to counter the pandemic impact. So a number of defaults, uh, it, it could happen last year, but it, pro it, it possibly postponed to the future days. Um, but it looks now that the, the Chinese economy is uh, getting back on its feet and they are, uh, from 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 number we can see that there are already more than half of the provinces is yielding above three percent GDP growth in 2020, 
And the Penguin International has also estimated the GDP growth of China in 2021 to be uh, above 8% uh, in last September. And it is it is it looks like it is, it is heading that way as well. Uh, so given the situation, the policy priority for Chinese government is likely to shift back to the issues like deleveraging de environmental pr protection, the optimization of uh, uh, economy, uh, economy structure, uh, and the monetary easing is likely to fade out in China as well. So if we add this up, uh, the default is likely to pick up in both the number of cases and amount um, uh, for 2021 and probably uh, the following year. Uh, but again, we, we, we insist the view that the Chinese government is keeping the default as close sight, is monitoring uh, the default situation very, very closely. And, uh, you know, in, 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 in YCEH's case, we already witnessed a series of, of very hand, uh, strong handy style uh, market reassurance uh, action uh, from various uh, uh, Chinese authorities. So in general, the government will, will, will keep allowing default to happen to some extent, but their hands are grasping the uh, steering wheel tight. So, not to, uh, so just to make sure things are still in control. So we, we think it is likely the case for uh, uh, in the recent years to come, but for sure we are on the front seat to monitor the situation to keep the market updated uh, of our views. Uh, on this page, I use the now still limited statistic of a recovery to make a, to make a table. So typically, there are two ways to resolve a default. The one is, of course, the, the, the debtors and creditors could work things out between themselves. Um, and another one is a, is a form of bankruptcy, uh, bankruptcy proceedings. So generally speaking, SOE is still doing uh, more or less better than, than POE for the investors in terms of both recovery rate and the date, date of recoveries. Uh, and off-core routing, as you can see from the table, uh, could take, uh, 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 is, is, is probably uh, a more speedy way compared to the, the onshore method. And also you can see um, the debt swap and the cash offering repurchasing are two new ways to manage uh, the, the debts. Essentially, the debt swap is a, is, is a market-oriented way uh, uh, for the debt extension. And, and cash offering is what the issuer will use to buy back the debt before the, the price drop into the bottom, uh, so which is very you, you know, uh, common for the Chinese distress scenario. Um, a side story relating to this, some of my uh, uh, asset manager friends said that the, the sudden drop in the bond price in China could possibly provide a unique junk bond trading opportunity. But I can see where they're coming from. Uh, but in my view, we, we probably still lacking a few important puzzles. For example, um, uh, default cases, recovery data. Um, you know, once we have that, we can build a highway. Uh, but now it is just missing. Um, Okay, legal-wise, I would say China is, uh, is also making progress for both dom domestic and international investors. For example, uh, China has launched a new version of security law in March 2020 to cover ten, uh, to make improvements in, uh, in 10 key aspects and highlight a few that are more relevant to the bond investors. Uh, so the violations and breaches are now become uh, uh, more costly than before. The investor protection, the information disclosure are improved, and the legal duties of intermediary agencies uh, agencies are better clarified. Uh, so soon after the new uh, security law being put in place in June, uh, we have a legal case uh, running through the China's judicial system, which is called Wuyang Construction, and the court actually held various intermediaries monetarily accountable for their wrongdoings in that case, which included the rating agency as well. It's the first time in the history. Uh, and uh, it, and uh, it, it has a very far reaching implications and detriment to the market. Uh, so try to nurture, uh, basically just try to nurture a more healthier um, a capital market in China. So other than the new security law, China has put in place 18 pieces of debt related laws and regulations uh, to make the improvement in year 2020. Uh, I think the message is that despite 
the fact that China has been criticized for lacking certain, you know, capital market infrastructure and practices over the years. Uh, if you if you extend your observation period to or to to about ten years horizon, uh, you could probably notice that China has been making a large number of baby steps to make the improvement, and it has come a long way. Uh, it is probably still far from ideal, but the market is improvement is is uh, is improving continuously. Yeah. So next, let's talk a little bit about the credit ratings in, in China. Um, so the first thing to remember when you are dealing with Chinese onshore bonds uh, and, the look, and and checking out their ratings is that the ratings attached are typically not of global scale. They are mostly uh, most likely of uh, uh, Chinese national scale. Uh, so to illustrate the differences, uh, earlier last year we picked about 132 Chinese issuers who have issued bonds in both domestic market and the international market. So uh, that means they uh, carry both uh, global ratings and national ratings at the same time. So you can see the differences on the on the two charts on the left. On the top, you have uh, you know Chinese national scale ratings. You can see uh, those ratings are highly concentrated and clustered in the three notches of triple triple A, uh, double A plus, and double A. Uh, so on the uh, at the bottom, you can see. Uh, that's uh, that's a global rating distribution. It's much much better uh, differentiated uh, and has a nicely shaped distribution. Um, on the right hand side, uh, I have a few actual cases here. Um, for example, Chalco, which is the largest aluminium company in China, is rated triple A onshore, but the uh, triple B plus offshore by us. And the Vanki, which is the largest property developer, and also rated triple A onshore, but uh, also triple B plus offshore by us. And also China Eastern Airline again is triple A rated onshore, uh, but A minus rated offshore by us. Uh, I would say there are many regulatory and technical reasons behind the gap between the, the two rating scales. But anyway, anyhow, global investors should never use Chinese scale rating to draw the comparison to the global ratings in their portfolio. It's an apple to orange. Uh, on the other hand, the Penguin International has been building uh, our global criteria and the global rating portfolio over the past three years. And we hope that we'll be able to, ex to, to quickly expand our global rating uh, coverage on Chinese uh, quite as quickly to help the global investor to better position and uh, locate the credit worthiness of the uh, of the investment target on the global credit spectrum. Uh, here are a few of our global rating cases for in, uh, for easier understanding. I would say on the list, uh, uh, more than half of of the names will be rated triple A onshore, but our global rating will be able to to tell the differences among them. So more so more importantly, sorry, let me switch back to here. So more importantly, uh, we have been, you know, carefully uh, calibrating our, our rating levels against the market average offshore. Uh, as of now, the, our deviation is well controlled with only about half a notch. Uh, so this rating scale could be easily referred to by many global investors, which is accustomed to global rating scales. Okay, here is another interesting exercise of uh, of ours. We have been publicly assigning the global ratings to the provincial level governments in China. Um, I think as as of now, we're probably the only ones doing this. Uh, at the moment, we cover uh, 20 provincial governments out of 31 Chinese uh, Chinese provinces, and you can see how their credit worthiness dif uh, differs uh, among each other. So overall speaking, you can see. Um, the east and south coastal provinces have a better credit profile than the inland provinces. This is this is the first time that the credit differentiation was introduced to the Chinese provinces, uh, as they were already triple A in the, the the Chinese onshore market. Uh, so other than that, we uh, we have been doing the scoring for the prefecture level cities and the county level cities as well. You can see that the distribution of the scores here. Uh, Okay, so last but not least, uh, we have put in place a government-related entity rating framework since 2018. So due to the limit of time, I don't want to bother you with all the details uh, here in the analysis and the scoring, but in essence, we evaluate 
uh, both the willingness and the capacity of the government to provide the, 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 the quality support. Um, and the, and the, as you can see here, we have a tier two, tier three, tier four quality factors. So the, so the external support is therefore captured and analyzed in a more quantifiable and the systematic manner. Uh, so the key takeaway here is that, um, I would say, first of all, the rate bound space in China re uh, so far remain default free. Then quality bound defaults are picking up and will continue to pick up. That's our view. Uh, for the investors who are interested in the credit bond space, they should probably pay more attention to the highly rated SOE names, uh, which uh, uh, could be once considered as safe. Uh, secondly, while the Chinese government is allowing the, the default to happen, uh, they are still keeping a very, uh, I would say, uh, they, are, they are still closely monitoring the situation, so not to let things get out of control. So in that sense, systematic uh, risk is unlikely, and uh, you know the the government, the Chinese government, still have plenty of tools in the kit. Uh, so credit rating wise, I would say the incumbent national scale credit rating is is currently under a lot of challenges these days. The regulators, even the rating agencies uh, itself, has been trying to revamp itself to make uh, to make a difference. So. As of now, the, the global investors should not compare the national scale ratings to the global ones. So Penguin International, we as a rating agency, has uh, uh, already have a uh, you know, global rating system up and running. So in the future, we, we will continue to, to, to expand the, the coverage to better help the international investor to, help, to, to, to position and understand Chinese credits. Uh, so lastly, China and uh, China and the Chinese market, I would say, still uh, they have come a long way in making the ongoing effort to improve its capital markets. Uh, I mean, its its legal system, its practices, and also its credit ratings. Okay, so this is to conclude my presentation, and here is my contact information. If you have any question about us or about the the credits of the industry on the name. Uh, uh, coming out of China, please feel to feel free to reach out. Also, here uh, we have uh, the, the QR code, and you can follow our LinkedIn page and our reach account to stay in tune. Thanks, Alexander. Back, back to you. Cool. Uh, there is an interesting question about how um, how about the uh, creditability concern that even a triple A bond can go into a default and does. Chinese government has something to do with it. So any ideas about uh, the, the investors? Well, like I said earlier, um, there, there's a lot of historical reason and, uh, you know, from, from both the regulation side and the, the, the quite the analytics side, you know, why, why, why do we have this national rating system, which is, which is vastly different to the global rating system now? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite an issue these days, and it has been attracting a lot of attention from multiple regulators in China, and uh, also from the, from, from the rating agency side. Uh, I mean, from, uh, speaking from the rating agency perspective, we, uh, what we can do is, is to make sure uh, our analytics are solid, and, uh, and, uh, trying, to, and trying to improve on the, on the, on the uh, existing system and make a difference here. However, still, you know, when we are trying to roll out this this, uh, this new rating scale, which is more comparable to the global to the global ones, there are still a lot of resistance in the market uh, from uh, uh, both from the re regulator side and from from the from the investor side as well, and uh, certainly from the issuer side. So I would say we 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 have already been able to deploy this tool to the market, but whether or not that can be readily accepted by various counterparty in the market, that still takes time. But uh, we will continue to, to work on that. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Terry. And uh, talking about the Peng Yuan's analytics, I would like to advertise it. Uh, you can find there is analytics on our website in the research hub. Thank you very much, Terry, for your presentation. Thank you for coming to us. Our next speaker, uh, Michelle Zhang, she's from the Agricultural Bank of China. She's the senior manager and she will talk about accessing to China capital market 
I'm Michelle Zhang. I'm from the Custody Service Department of uh, Agriculture Bank of China. So um, Agriculture Bank of China is one of the big four banks in China, and it's also the major financial um, service provider in China as well. So we do provide a full range of uh, service for foreign investors to invest in, um, in China capital market. For instance, uh, we are aligned with the global custodian to provide the local custody service, as well as the agent service uh, for the CIBM direct scheme. So um, I think, uh, so today I would first like to thank Sivan for giving us this opportunity to share with you some information on the access to the China capital market. And in the presentation today, um, I will, I sorry, I think I have a problem loading up the slides again. Um, in the presentation today, I will first give a brief overview of uh, um, all of the channels for foreign investors to invest in China. And then I will share some view on how to choose the proper channel uh, if you are interested in the market. And at last, I will give a brief introduction on the market, um, on market entry procedure and as well as how the investment workflow goes if you invest locally. So first, um, let's look at this uh, slides. Um, so there, um, so if you are interested in investing in the stock and the bond market in China, uh, there are five major um, channels that you can choose from. So from the investment perspective, if you are investing in bonds in China, um, the, which uh, in the China interbank bond market, which is CIBM, uh, which is also the largest bond trading market in China, then you will have um, four options. So um, you will have the Bank Connect, the CIBM Direct, the QV, uh, as well as the Wubi. Uh, Wubi stands for the wholly owned uh, foreign enterprise. And if you uh, want to invest in China Asia, then you'll probably have uh, these three options, QV, Wubi, and Stock Connect. So each channel um, will have uh, its own unique features. So for instance, the Wufi is uh, the wholly owned foreign enterprises is actually uh, quite different from the other four options in the way that uh, the foreign investors has to actually to set up a domestic entity here in China and the Wufi will be participate in the market as a, less, uh, as a local investors. So however, um, this option is very time consuming and uh, energy consuming. So most of the foreign investors will uh, use the other four options to invest in the, uh, the stock and the bond market. So um, for the stock and bond, um, so you are, um, for the stock, bond connect and the stock connect, um, all the accounts are actually open offshore and then uh, in Hong Kong and foreign investors will not actually uh, have to involve with the local regulators as well as the local entities here in China. Uh, we are normally call them the connect scheme. And for CBM Direct and QV, um, they are uh, more like a local scheme. So um, the foreign investor has to go through like a market entry procedures. Uh, for instance, the QV, um, you have to apply a license but, uh, with the SRC and you have to registration, uh, make a registration with SAFE. And for CIBM Direct, you have to uh, make a registration with PBOC as well. So, um, but although they are like a market, a market entry procedure to go, uh, these two schemes, CIBM Direct and QV, also have its uh, advantages in the way that you will, the investors will have like a larger investment scope and enjoy more local service uh, in the connect, than the Connect program. So the next time, um, I would, so most of the time, um, the foreign investors are a little bit confused views um, about which channel they should use to enter the market um, because they're not just two, they're like more, uh, four. Thus, uh, in this part, um, I will like make some comparisons uh, between these uh, different options. Um, so you can hopefully, hopefully it will give you a, like a better picture of uh, each option. So um, there are several things to, to be considered um, um, before you make your decision. So first of all, what do you want to invest in? Are you just interested in um, uh, bond or just Ch China A shares or bond and uh, um, A shares together? And the other options you have to think about is whether you are comfortable with opening an account in China onshore or just to prefer to open an account in Hong Kong uh, under the, like, the Connect program, the Stock and the Bond Connect. And the next is, is um, do you want to hope to do your FX, on FX hedging onshore or offshore? because the price may vary in different markets. And then maybe um, the time to enter the 
uh, for the market entry or may also be one of your considerations because uh, um, the connect program will be faster, but uh, for the CIBM and di um, CIBM direct and QB, they'll probably take you like two months to go. And the other small things we may be interested in is that whether you are interested in the other um, is instruments in here in the local market, for instance, the uh, derivatives like index futures, um, uh, the commodity futures, or do you want to invest in the mutual and private fund here in China, as well as do you want to participate in the IPO of the stock? of the China A shares. So um, first, um, I would just like to uh, talk a bit more about the two um, local access, so uh, first is QFI and CIBM. So I will make a comparison here. You can see um, for the market entry, they are quite different. So for the QFI, um, because you have the different regulators, you have to apply a QFI license with uh, CSRC, and then you have to registration with SAFE. But uh, for the uh, CIBM Direct, you are actually uh, have to do a filing with PPOC to get into the market. Uh, for the quota, there's no quota under the both schemes, but do you, you need to file like expected investment filing under the CIBM Direct? The investment scope are very different. Um, basically, I can say QB has the largest investment scope for all the options. You can invest both in the exchange market, in the CIBM market, as well as the, um, the futures market in China. But for the CIBM Direct, you can just only invest uh, in the CIBM bonds uh, and other instruments that are listed, uh, that, have, that are in the uh, CIBM bond market. And for the currencies, uh, they are actually the same. Um, the, um, the foreign investors can inject both the CNH or the other foreign currencies um, to the market. And but for each scheme, um, you have to find a local partners here in China. For QB, uh, a local custodian is required. That means you have to um, set up a relationship with local custodians. But mostly, if you have your investment abroad with and work with the global custodians, most of global custodians do have their um, partners here in the local market. And, and also, you have to build up a uh, re agent relationship with the brokers who will help you to place the order um, in the market, in the exchange. And for the CIBM Direct, um, you do need to have an agent bank so um, who will help you actually to place the trade order or set uh, and settle in the market. And accounts are, you know, it's just depending on which interest you want to open. So there are several accounts you can open at different uh, uh, places, so I just leave that alone. Uh, but for repatriation, some of the clients they do worry about the repat um, uh, investors they do worry about the repatriations. Are there any restriction on that? Uh, basically, for CIBM direct, there's no um, any restrictions on um, repatriations. You just you know it instructs your agent or custody bank to do so. That's okay. But for Q feed, um, you need to pay your tax uh, before uh, you. Do you repat uh, before you repatriate your fund, and um, you have to like submit a com uh, tax commitment letter before um, if you want to repatriate profit. But for principal, that's okay. You can repatriate at any time. The next, um, just um, I would like to talk about um, um, uh, uh, the two options for QV and uh, versus stock connect because that's uh, many of the people will think about. If they want to talk, um, if, if they want to invest in China A shares, so that is probably their uh, top two choices. So for QV and Stock Connect, um, you, um, the, as I mentioned earlier, the market entry is different. Um, for QV, there's two. Uh, you have to get a QV license with CRCRC and make your registration with SAFE. Uh, but the process will not take too long. You normally, just if all the documents are ready, you just around uh, one to two months, one, one month um, for now. And for stuck neck, you have to you know, find a local um, uh, broker or the custodian accounts to trade with. And for the quota, um, QV, there's no quota. You can you know, invest as much as you want. But for stuck neck, there's like a daily quota at the market level, but that shouldn't be a very much influence uh, for the investors. And for the investment scope, um, as I mentioned earlier, QV had you can um, have basically invest almost all the instruments uh, in China as the as the domestic uh, investors. So um, you can invest in 
uh, China Asia's, uh, the own exchange bonds, the CIBM bonds, the mutual fund, and all the few, uh, financial futures, commodity futures. You can also even do the FX derivatives um, locally. But for stock net, that's just um, some of these uh, shares that listed on the exchange, but it's not all of them. So for the uh, operation independence, uh, I think I mentioned earlier that for QV, you have to find a local custodian uh, as well as um, uh, local brokers. So if you want to invest in CIBM under uh, QV, um, your local custodian normally can also be your agent um, agent bank. So you just have to do that relationship with one uh, local entity. For the uh, stock now you have to place the other through the, um, the, the Hong, uh, broker in Hong Kong. For the repatriations, um, I think that is, yeah, you need to repatriate, uh, just as mentioned earlier, you have to pay your tax before you repatriate your profit. But there's no restrictions on the stock connect because, because everything is as happened offshores. And so that's a, one good thing about um, the connect program. However, uh, under the QP scheme, you do have other advantages. For instance, you will actually build up a partnership with the uh, local investors, uh, with the local service provider. And also, you will have access to more uh, local regulatory and market information. Um, you may worry about um, whether you know you have to deal with uh, more, uh, still, you know, so many local regulators here in China, but that shouldn't be a very big problem because your partners, for instance, your local custodian or your um, agent bank here in China will help you to deal with them. So it's like one single point connect. You just have to talk to your custodian or your agent bank, and they will help you to um, actually to build up all the relationship with the local regulators to submit all the materials. You don't have to directly have a contact with the local regulators. The next um, slides, um, we'll talk about uh, the CIBM direct uh, versus the bond connect, because uh, if you want, you're interested in bond, that probably will be um, the two, 12 year op options. So um, for the market entry, I think actually you all, um, regardless whether you go uh, choose the CIBM Direct or Bank Connect, you have to um, get approval from like PBOC. So that's probably the same. Just for CIBM Direct, you have sent me your materials uh, through your agent bank here in China, while Bank Connect, you will um, through, uh, uh, apply via the Bank Connect. And there's no quota under the both schemes. And the investment scope, um, that's, I think, um, Phil just mentioned earlier. So um, in the past, uh, under CIBM Direct, you can invest in both bonds, um, you know, all the uh, bond lendings, the RAS, um, FX derivatives, and even for some entities, you are able to participate in the repos. For the bond connect, it's major bound, and now I understand that oh, there are some like FX derivatives you can also do it under the bond connect. But still, for the CIBM direct, you will have um, the larger uh, investment scope. You are basically can participate in all the instruments in the CIBM market and the CFX market. And for the, um, I think we'll just um, skip to the some of the part and say about the trading counterparties. So um, for the um, Trading counterparties under the CIBM Direct, you are able to actually trade with um, all the uh, participants in the CFAT, um, so in the market. While while under the Bank Connect, uh, their counterparties are only limited to the 56 mar market makers. And for the trading orders, um, so now uh, last year, uh, CFAT has opened a new program that allows uh, direct trading with the market makers. Uh, using uh, RFQ um, functions uh, in Bloomberg and Trade Web. So um, in the past, you have you have to um, you know place your order only via the agent bank, but now uh, you can place the order directly uh, via the Bloomberg and Trip Web. That will be quite similar to the uh, Bank Connect program. So in that case, um, the investors doesn't have to actually send orders locally to the agent bank. They can just place the order on their desktop. And for the um, for the accounts, um, the are are like uh, are, you know because you are local invest locally, you have to open all the accounts onshore, um, just as all the uh, local program compared to the Connect program. Um, on the Connect program, the accounts are open offshore 
while um, for the CIBM Direct, you have to open your cash account uh, with your agent or custodian bank. You have to open a bank account um, on the two bank depositories here in uh, China, CCBC and Shanghai Clearing. Uh, or you'll also open a trading account with CFS. That all account opening will, um, your custodian bank or your agent bank will help you to open all those accounts. You only have to submit uh, the materials uh, um, you know, in accordance with uh, the um, requirement of this uh, market infrastructures. So you don't have to worry much about that. And it won't take much long time. Normally, it's just like um, it's less than a month to so have all the account open uh, locally. And for the repatriations, um, it just, um, you know, it's the same. You have to, because it's, all the accounts are open onshore, so you need to instruct your custo uh, custodian or agent bank to do the repatriations. And the other cool things about um, CIBN Direct compared to Bank Connect, it's just similar to the other uh, local programs, is that you are actually building up a partnership with a local service provider uh, that can, that maybe not just your um, partner in um, you know in your uh, China Asia or CIBM direct investment, but it can in other perspectives. And also because um, the Chinese um, the China the local service providers has more uh, connections with the regulators and the market, you will be able to have more access um, to the um, regulatory and the market information in China. And the next. Um, I would just spend a little um, time on about the market entry uh, procedures. Uh, this is uh, because of the Connect program, all the um, accounts are open offshore. You have just deal with your brokers or your uh, global custodians. Um, but for QV and CIBM Direct, um, you know, there are some local um, you know, uh, service provider you have to deal with. So uh, here I got a summary here on um, on the right hand side is that for the QV, you know, it's a, you have to find a local custodian and local broker. And optional is an agent bank is that if you want to invest in the CIBM bond market, you have to find an agent bank. But as I mentioned earlier, the local custodian and agent bank can be one bank. So for instance, ABC can both can be served both as your local custodian as and as your agent bank. So you only have to deal with one local service provider. And for the CIBM Direct, you have to find an agent bank. Uh, local custody is uh, optional. However, if you have um, um, if you have a global custodian uh, you offer investment, uh, that you probably will have a local custodian uh, they they've been working with uh, in China. So um, to start with, so if you want to enter the market, you know locally, um, you have to you know build up the relationship with the um, you know, the local service provider, as I mentioned earlier, you have to sign an agreement with them. You have to talk about the fee schedules and do the KYC. Um, so for the, from the regulator side, um, for the QV, if you want to apply for the QV license um, under the new regulations, it would probably just take one month um, if all the documents are ready. And then it would probably take just one to two weeks to uh, register with SAFE. And if you are doing uh, dealing with PBOC for the CIBM entry, um, if you have all the documents ready, they'll probably take you 10 business days at that half a month. So that actually isn't that long uh, as most of the foreign investors think for the market entry if you want to enter the market, uh, lo local market. So it's for the um, market entry side, in terms of the regulatory approval, it normally will just take you one to two months to have all the things um, be ready. Once you get all the license um, and the filing is uh, completed, then you can open your account. Um, you know, account opening um, for the both cash and security account uh, that probably takes uh, like, um, you know, um, um, uh, like 15 business days. Um, so altogether, um, if you go from start from the applications um, to all the you have all the account opened, it will probably take you two to three months to enter the market. So that isn't that long as you think it is. And then next, um, I will just spend a few minutes on to talk about the um, your local service model. So how you will work like. Uh, 
you know, you know between among the investors and about the local service providers. So um, it's very similar whether if you enter the market as QV or or it's on, or under the CIBM Direct. So um, first of all, if you uh, want to invest in bond, you have to find uh, someone help you like an agent. So you can choose um, either you direct trading, you see the CIBM RFQ functions, or you can trade via an agent. So the agent uh, bank will help you to place the um, order in the CFS with the trading platform uh, for the CIBM bonds. And for the settlement, once you make your trade orders, uh, then you also have to place a settlement instruction to your global custodian, or if not directly to the local custodian, will help you to settle the bonds in the market. And the same way as the um, stocks in the China A shares. So you will actually place the trading order with the broker and will help you to place the trading, um, place the trade in the Shanghai and Shenzhen Stock Exchange. And after you place the trade order, you have to send a settlement instructions to the local custodian um, who will help you to settle uh, the trades in the market. So for um, then on the next slides, I would just um, like to spend a few minutes about um, to talk about the service um, the asset uh, the local service provider can provide to you so for uh, as abc we can provide a comprehensive asset servicing uh, to the foreign investors uh, besides lo uh, the local um the ordinary the standard uh, custody service like safekeeping settlement uh, we can also be your fx counterparties in the market where we can just help you to uh, directly uh, settle the fx uh, with our bank uh, in addition, we do provide the corporate actions. We can provide you with the latest uh, corporate actions information in the market, as well as we can help you to build up, um, you know, a, a accounting book and help you to uh, do the accounting and evaluations, as well as we'll provide some tax services. So I know many foreign investors are worried about the tax things, you know, whether how to pay the tax, you know, but with the custodian here, we'll help you to do all these things um, to give you instructions, um, you know, guidance on those um, tax issues, as well as we'll do help we'll give our uh, uh, update market news and informations to you by emails or by other means uh, by our internet platform, so you can get a latest head up of the what happened in the market. So um, I think um, that is uh, all for my presentation today, and the this slide shows my contact. So if you have uh, any questions about uh, lo the ways you can access the local market, whether it's QV, CIB, Direct, or Stock Connect, please just feel free to shoot me an email. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and we have two questions here regarding the taxes in the bond market. So when, re when talking about QV account, what tax rate mm -hmm. is involved? Oh, it's a 10% uh, for the stock dividend um, and the coupon payment. But now for CIBM bond, the tax is exempted until the end of this year. Uh, we're still not sure of, uh, in the future what the tax policy will be for the CIBM bond. But right now, it's exempted for CIBM bond. Uh, for the stock dividend, is 10%. And the cash, uh, sorry, for the cash dividend on stocks is 10%, as well as your cash interest in All the right. cash account. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And what about the withholding tax on bonds? It is it is ten percent as well, right? Yeah, it's ten percent. But right now it's uh, exempted, right, in the CIBM. But that's uh, until end of this year. So, uh, what's the tax policy for the next uh, next year? Uh, we're not sure about that. We'll just have to wait for the tax bureau to release the latest policies on that. Okay, thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you for coming. And the next speaker is also okay. from the Agricultural Bank of China. This is Haley from Agricultural Bank of China. And thanks to the previous speakers, I believe that you have already got insight into the overview of CIBM, the index inclusion, and various schemes for you to access the market. So I will skip the duplicate parts and introduce some more details from the perspective of a local market maker as your potential counterpart and agent bank. And let's start, uh, still start from the market itself. 
The onshore CNY bond market has been developing these years and has a size of 110 trillion yuan by the end of last year, making it the second largest individual bond market in the world. The onshore bond market can further be uh, subdivided into the CIBM and exchange trade bond market. We will focus on CIBM today since it accounts for uh, close to 90% of outstanding bond issuance and it is uh, the only market, uh, the only bond market that um, currently the foreign investors like you have been given access to. The CIBM is regulated by the PBOC and is supported by the CCDC and SHCH. Uh, CCDC and SHCH provide the registration, depository, and settlement services for the interbank market. CCDC is responsible for government, financial, and enterprise bonds. And, and the SHCH oversees NCDs, commercial papers, and medium-term notes. Since commercial banks are the largest investor in this market and they tend to buy and hold bonds to maturity, and therefore the question about the market liquidity are raised. In general, policy bank bonds, CGBs and NCDs are the most liquid, followed by the local government bonds and corporate bonds, including um, midterm mid notes and uh, commercial paper. Financial bonds and certain credit bonds are regarded illiquid. In fact, even among CDB bonds and CGBs, uh, liquidity exists only for certain on the run issues. Uh, the regulatories and uh, infrastru infrastructure institutions have made efforts these years to promote the, the bond liquidities. And for uh, foreign investors like you, um, mostly uh, only the CGBs and policy bank bonds are considered uh, investable. But since um, the liquidity and the, the participation of foreign investors in this market have been developing, um, and also thanks to efforts uh, by uh, institutions like uh, like Peng Yuan of Terrace, um, we can also see that the your participation in the credit bonds is also growing. CGBs and policy bank bonds uh, are actually the two segments that included in the global bond benchmarks. And next, uh, let's talk a, take a look into how foreign investors like you are participating in CIBM. Interest in China's onshore bond market has been rising steadily since 2016, when the market was thrown open to foreign investors. Uh, foreign holdings of onshore bonds now exceed uh, 400 billion US dollar and are set to rise further as Chinese bonds are added to major global fixed income in indexes. At the moment, there are three major global indices that have included or announced that they that they are going to include onshore Chinese China government bonds and quasi sovereign bonds. The final index weight of China onshore bonds in these benchmarks are in the range of five percent to ten percent. And based on the current assets on the management of these benchmarks, the resultant estimated index related flow into onshore bonds are in the range of. Um, 240 billion US dollar. We believe that the uh, role of RMB as a reserve currency will also contribute to the rising of um, the foreign inflow into this market, into the bond market. Because the role of RMB as a reserve currency has been growing, its share among global FX reserves rose to a record 2.1% uh, as of Q, uh, the third quarter of 2020. 
uh, the, R the, the UN's uh, reserve currency status uh, could rise further as the world further de-dollarize, de and its share among reserve currencies may reach 5% by the end of 2025, which implies that a demand of over 300 billion US dollar uh, worth of RMB assets. Um, the RMB share could also uh, could grow on rising demand for Chinese assets, with CGB yield advantage over their SDR counterparties. So as you know that the foreign ownership ratio in China's bond market remains low. However, the continuous relaxation of regulations and barriers to foreign investment has led to a gradual rise in foreign holdings in uh, China's bond market in recent years. Currently, uh, the foreign investors account for around 2.7% of bond holdings. Um, the bond, uh, the foreign holdings have doubled since 10 years ago and are concentrated in uh, the varieties uh, of CGB policy bank bonds and NCDs, as you see on the uh, on the graph on the right of this page. Uh, for now, the foreign investors still hold um, re relatively fewer corporate bonds and local government bonds. Mm, that may be due to the liquidity and the credit risk discussed before. So since 2016, Chinese authorities have implemented various programs and measures to improve the accessibility uh, of the onshore bond market for foreign investors. And um, apart from the CIBM Direct Access, Access Program and QVR QV uh, programs um, is, um, launched earlier, um, a separate Bond Connect program was launched in July 2017, which provides another route to access the bond market. So Phoebe from Bond Connect uh, company just walks you through the convenience and scalability of this game, uh, which has con contributed to its popularity. And so there are now uh, more than 2,400 um, approved investors from across 33 jurisdictions on the bond net. And the trading activity was also boosted, observing from the re uh, recent year's daily trading volume by uh, foreign investors. So foreign investors in China's bond market are dominated by commercial banks. And the remainder of investor base is mainly made up of sovereign institutions and asset management companies. Treasury bonds, NCDs, and policy bank bonds are the most popular types of bonds among foreign investors. And in terms of tenor, the foreign investors tend to trade seven to 10 year, followed by uh, the, those less than one year. Based, up, uh, based on our tr own trading experience, it may be due to the liquidity management demands. And next, I will use ABC as an example to explain how a local market maker can help you in RMB bond trading. Uh, as Michelle just, uh, just introduced, ABC is one of the four major state-owned commercial banks in China. And in the financial market, we also play a major role. In CIBM, backed by the abundant bond inventories, ABC has built up outstanding capabilities in market making. Uh, the cap uh, such capability enables us to um, provide you with the continuous quotations for both on the run bonds and off the run bonds. Um, as I explained earlier, um, many foreign investors have a concern about the liquidity of, of, the, wrong, of the wrong bonds, uh, but um, 
we believe that an, a qualified counterparty could also um, quote for your uh, for bid and offers of off the round bonds uh, because of our um, bond holdings um, adapted for foreign investors' preference. And we are, uh, as a as a commercial bank uh, with um, relatively lower mass, uh, risk, risk appetite, we are especially good at variety of, of, of bonds, including CGBs, policy bank bonds, NCDs, and highly rated credit bonds. And these varieties are also uh, those preferred by foreign investors in, in the current stage. Um, as outstanding market maker, we rank high in the uh, among the, all the market all, all the market participants and we have won a series of awards and trophies um awarded by market infrastructure institutions and also the global medias in fact abc um is uh, dedicated to expand its foreign trading uh I'm sorry uh, is, we are dedicated to uh, expand our global trading uh, networks. So uh, we have made efforts to um, expand the foreign trading business. We have built up a professional service team um, with, uh, with talents from trading, settlements, clearing, research, and uh, even the investment con consultancy area. And um, because we are the pilot institution that um, participating in the overseas um, trading business, uh, we have a rich client base. And our, our um, agent clients include uh, the world's best, uh, world's, the world's, uh, world's largest sovereign wealth fund and the top two international sovereign um, financial organizations. And our counterparties include 10 of the 20 world's top asset management companies. Um, as you know that under the CIBM scheme, you uh, accept, um, except for the cash bond, you also have access to the local repo market and, uh, and, also, the, uh, uh, and also the domestic OTC FX derivatives uh, instrument. And we, um, as the as pilot again, uh, we are the first Chinese bank to support OTC FX derivatives uh, for those who have the hedging demand. And uh, in the year or when Ripple was first opened to overseas investors under the CIBM direct access, um, the uh, Ripple trading market share of our clients is 37% during that year. Our custodian service is also leading and experienced, um, but my, co my colleague Michelle has ex introduced quite a lot, so I will skip this page as well. Since local market makers and or maybe um, local financial institutions, among all, we are actually competing with each other to expand the um, global trading business. So we have um, we have built up the foreign CIBM services um, for, for all the overseas clients, no matter which stage of, uh, you, are, you are currently at. Um, we start reaching out to foreign investors uh, like what we are doing now. Uh, so it's the, some of you are still before the market entry stage. And we welcome that uh, you contact us and we will build up the contact with you, such as building, uh, such as creating a Bloomberg group chat um, for uh, the market, market intelligence sharing, and any questions um, you want to inquire. And also, we uh, as a as a um, local market maker with a long history of trading, we have a good relationship with regulators and market infrastructure institutions. So uh, we will be helpful if you have any uh, specific questions that, or maybe very new questions, um, we can um, forward to um, the regulators and then get the answer for you. And during your market entry uh, procedure, um, for example, if you um, choose us as your 
CIBM Direct Agent Bank. Uh, we will do the step up, step by step market entry guidance for you. And uh, for detailed questions, um, our custodian department, um, like Michelle and I, uh, are willing to hold uh, um, another conference call with you to discuss the account structure, the um, the whole account opening procedure, um, and also the due diligence um, process, and also the um, custodian service. Um, we are willing to hold another conference call with you to discuss all the details. And after market entry, uh, we have two roles, um, including the custodian, we have three roles um, in cooperating with you. First, we can be your counterparty, uh, which, which we are very good at. We can quote uh, the bonds um, for you. And um, as, your, as your agent bank, um, under the CIBM direct access, we can do the FX hedging for you. And our Hong Kong branch, as um, the one of Hong Kong settlement banks in, um, in the bond connect scheme, and they can do the offshore FX hedging for you. And we also have some um, value added services like, so I'll skip, skip that. Uh, we also have some uh, value added service like um, the um, real time market updates. For example, uh, the primary auction results, or we will share the um, results with you in a very uh, timely manner. And um, we can also share the an analysis and also um, the views from, uh, from, from a local, local investor's perspective. And others like the uh, research report, uh, the, monk, uh, the monthly teleconference in both English and Chinese sharing the market outlook and um, the customized primary market service, which I will introduce later. Uh, we are also uh, improving day by day. So for the primary market participation, I, um, I made a a uh, specific page for it because um, as we observe that many invest many uh, foreign investors have such demand because they need to get um, for example a large amount in one time for a certain bond and in that case only the primary market can satisfy your demand we will provide the service starting from the notice of auction schedule and also the anticipation of the uh, auction results. Um, and also the, uh, we will uh, provide a flexible settlement arrangement for you. Um, it's all negotiable with us uh, as long as our internal compliance agrees. And this page is an example of our marketing intelligence uh, sharing with you. Um, so from the very left, this is the, um, you can see the bond auction result. And in the middle, um, this is an example of our daily market briefing. Uh, we share the most updated information of the financial market. Um, we focus on the bond market and foreign exchange market. And we, uh, we send it uh, every morning in Beijing time. So I believe that uh, when you wake up uh, in in your local time, and you have already received our market uh, briefing. Um, and um, every month we hold a telecom a tele seminar with foreign investors, uh, introducing the uh, looking back to the market in the past months, and maybe we can also share the outlook of the market in the in the future months. And for example, uh, we held a teleseminar before the spring festival holiday, um, like seven days ago, to share our outlook of the bond market in 2021. And we've got uh, two questions here in chat. So, 
Um, yeah, so again, here, look, uh, local government bonds are traded uh, with a spread to the central government bonds, although they are risk-free. So, any comments on it? So, uh, I believe uh, the spread is not, uh, not generated by the risk premium, but it's um, due to the, um, like, due to the, um, how this variety, how the local government bonds was generated. It's actually a local, um, um, it emerges because um, the local short-term short -term debt needs to be converted into long-term uh, standardized bonds. And because of the local governments, um, their demand for such conversion, um, they they are willing to um, give that spread to investors. All right. Yes, thank you. And one more question uh, about uh, opportunities of the onshore CNY corporate credits versus offshore USD corporate credits. Um, it seems that the poor liquidity on the onshore credits is still uh, a key concern for international investors. So, any comments about the liquidity problem of the CNY? Okay, so um, the comparison between the onshore and offshore RMB bond market has been uh, discussed for years, and uh, I believe that. The development of the and opening up of, of the onshore bond market will um, generally resolve the concern about the liquid uh, the liquidity issue of onshore credit bonds. Um, honestly, for now, that uh, the offshore, no matter uh, offshore RMB or USD corporate corporate uh, credits. Um, they may be more popular among investors because of their higher yields. But um, the market size of two markets, um, I mean, the market size of onshore market and the, the onshore CNY and uh, the offshore CNY and, off, sorry, offshore CNH and offshore USD bond market, um, the, um, the the previous one is, is obviously much larger. So I believe the liquidity issue is just a problem of, of time. Um, and I believe that efforts have been made by the market makers, the, uh, the um, issuers, and also the uh, infrastructure uh, institutions. So I believe that in, in future days, the problem will be generally resolved and uh, we can see a more liquid onshore credit bond market all right thank you thank you Haley. and there is uh, one question about uh, can we apply inquiries to your russian branch yeah actually uh only my teammates are on the list but uh, okay i think my uh, colleague from the the Moscow branch. Um, oh, he's not in the conference yet. Uh, all um, right. And anyway, um, anyway, you can contact uh, Heidi, and she will con help you to contact to the Russian branch. You believe, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you very yeah. much, and thanks everyone for coming, for staying with us. Uh, thank you, everybody, and thank you, Haley. Thanks to all of our speakers and audience, and that it is the end of our online seminar. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>